I'm looking at the number of participants joining, and as soon as we have uh, a few more joining, I'm hoping that we'll we'll have an we have a lot of people who have registered, but let's see how many people we get. The numbers are going up. That's good. <laughs> We're getting close to fifty. Um, so let's just let's just give them one more minute. Numbers going up, stabilizing, so we can get started shortly. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and Happy New Year. For many of you, probably is the first webinar of the year. Um, so I hope we leave you with good impressions and lots of energy for more Zoom meetings and more webinars, learning from each other. Um, so let's get started. We have um, close to 70 people now. That's very impressive. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Shada Badi from uh, Open Data Watch, Managing Director of Open Data Watch. I'm also the co-chair of SCSN Trends. And for those of you who don't know, Trends is a thematic research network on data and statistics. It's really a research network looking at some of the very important issues of data and evidence-based policy making. We particularly look at areas that may be some of the more um, larger organizations or intergovernmental organizations have more difficulty addressing. So we are really an independent research group. Um, and uh, the co-chair of this group is also uh, part of this discussion. Um, Bob Chen, and the founding director of the group is with us, Jessica Espy, who actually started the SDSN Trends in 2015 and asked me to uh, be her uh, partner in crime and co-chair the group. And also um, Grant Cameron was also the director for a number of years. Um, and, and right now the current acting director is not with us for this webinar, but I hope you'll get to know and SCSN Trends and get to be part of this important network. Today, we're launching a work that we have done uh, on reviewing the report on the world that counts and the status of the data revolution. This is the work that uh, was started with the Secretary General Panel on Data Revolution for Sustainable Development in 2014. And in fact, Bob and I were part of that uh, advisory panel. And the, the term data revolution, in fact, came from another high level panel that then Secretary General started in 2014, the high level panel. And I have lots of stories how that name came about. If anybody is interested, get in touch with me, but I would not spend my few minutes doing opening remark to tell you about the story of the data revolution. But it has been really important term and it's been important <coughs> to find it that we are uh, we are looking at in this assumption work. For me, being involved in that work for so many years, um, I have learned so much of what that uh, data revolution and what the whole activity around data has brought us for sustainable development and the uh, and S SDG 2030 agenda. I wanted to just mention three things before we get started. First is that the what I have learned from the data revolution discussions and all the work that has followed up is that we really need to look at the data through throughout the data value chain. We have in many ways been uh, very much concerned with data production, but in, in the past 10 years and since we started uh, looking at data revolution, we are much more of looking at data, how data is accessible, how data is used, how data is linked to policy, and what is the impact of data. So data value chain and looking throughout the data value chain has been really important part and one of the things that I have learned from the data revolution. The second thing has been very important that's brought by the data revolution and the discussions around the SDGs has been that we really need to do better in counting everybody, you know, leaving no one behind, counting people uh, both in sort of disaggregated data in race, 
gender, disability, uh, ethnicity, and all other dimensions, you know, and also kind of looking at the data much more in terms of, as I said, leaving no one behind and creating a sort of, a, with data, uh, equality, uh, improving inequalities. So that's the second aspect of the data revolution that you're gonna hear also from our speakers today. The third one and the last one is that the data revolution and all these improvements in different sources of data, private sector involvement in data, citizens involvement in data has taught us that we have to do much better on data governance. And it's not only just data governance in the traditional sense of data quality assessment, better security or privacy, but it's really data governance of in, in increasing data agencies, increasing the voice of people in data and engaging more of the data producers and users in data. So those are the three big lessons for me one of the oldest people in this group and being involved in this uh, uh, in this activities for the past number of years that I have taken and we will see you hear that in the in the presentations and also discussions now moving to the to the assumptions work and launch of this work and we are really glad to see so many of you who have joined us we're going to start with uh, with a presentation uh, from Castellin Tillis. Castellin is the research manager of SCSM Trends and one of the key authors of the assumptions paper of assumptions research and work. She's going to take us through that. And then also Kathleen is going to help us to moderate a session with this amazing, really amazing set of speakers that we have today. And she will be also presenting the speakers. I mentioned, of course, the, the names already. So let's go to you, Kathleen. There are going to be opportunities for you, for your audience to ask us questions. Uh, we really want to get this as a discussion group to, uh, to uh, for the assumptions to stimulate discussions around these topics. So uh, this is not really a sort of a, it's a live uh, activity that we have taken on and we even have a website that Kasselin would mention to you. So let me stop at this point and uh, with the, uh, pass the uh, microphone, so-called, to Castellin. And thank you again for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Shada, for the warm introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As was mentioned, my name is Castellin Tillis, and I'm the research manager for SDS and Trends. Um, I am delighted to be presenting this work on behalf of the principal authors and contributors from our research network. Uh, we have spent the past two years working on this project entitled Revisiting Assumptions About the Data Revolution, Where Have We Made Progress and Where Are We Being Held Back? And today we're releasing the end product of this research project in an interactive format to inspire dialogue on data use for sustainable development. Uh, just some brief housekeeping announcements before we, be before we begin. This session will be recorded and we're inviting participants to ask questions using the Q&A feature within Zoom webinar. If time permits, uh, we'll do our best to answer a few questions from the audience um, after the moderated discussion. As Shada mentioned, we want this to be interactive, so we do want to hear from you and glean your in insights as well. Um, as far as the run of show, after a brief overview of the Assumptions Project, we'll dive into the moderated discussion, um, and we'll, we'll close with um, a live poll and um, sort of a Q&A from the audience, um, and uh, we hope that you'll find this session engaging. So um, let's begin. Uh, what is the purpose of the Assumptions Project? Uh, there was a flagship report published in 2014 entitled A World That Counts, Mobilizing the Data Revolution for Sustainable Development. Uh, this report provided a roadmap for how data might accelerate the development agenda. Uh, prepared at the request of the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, this report's launch predated the General Assembly's adoption of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Eight years have since passed um, since the release of World That Counts um, and formal adoption of the SDGs. This seems like an appropriate time for us and other members of the global data community to reflect on where progress has been made so far. Uh, this project supports that objective in three ways. One, it evaluates the assumptions that underpin a World That Counts core hypothesis that the data revolution would lead to better outcomes across the 17 SDGs. 
Two, it summarizes where and how we have made progress since the report's publication. And lastly, it identifies knowledge gaps related to each assumption. By analyzing these assumptions, we can reflect on how development actors might adapt their activities to a new set of circumstances in the final seven years of the SDGs. Um, while the report, A World That Counts, uh, primarily targeted global statistics and de the development community, many of its recommendations um, also engage uh, practitioners from the private sector, the non-government sector, and citizen-generated initiatives. Um, our hope in, in, in launching this project is, the, is to validate the extent to which certain assumptions um, that underpin a world that counts core hypothesis, whether they prove to be true. Um, the, okay. In order to formulate the assumptions, SES and Trends formed a working group between October 2021 and April 2023, so about 18 months to review and formulate the core assumptions. The working group comprised of SES and TRENDS members, um, many of whom are online uh, today for the panel discussion and other experts in the SCG data community. We identified assumptions that were largely implicit within a world that counts. I would direct you to um, our website for more details on our methodology. Um, so here are the six core assumptions that we identified that underpin a world that counts implicit theory of change. I'll walk through them briefly and expound a bit further. So the first sort of fundamental assumption is that technical progress would lead to greater data availability. Uh, two, the SDGs would be the driving force for data, in data innovations for public good. Three, information gaps are the main reason for policy failure. Four, the SDGs would enable resource mobilization for the data revolution. Uh, five, the public sector would guide and drive data innovations for sustainable development. And lastly, data would be a standardizing force for greater accountability. So again, just a brief overview of each assumption. Um, we'll preview the interactive web website shortly where you can see um, each assumption in greater detail. And again, we're encouraging you to explore uh, the website a bit further. So assumption one is perhaps the most foundational. It's the assumption that technical progress would allow for greater volumes, velocity, veracity, and variety of data for SDG monitoring. Um, and within the report, we synthesize um, evidence from the research literature as well as case studies, again, to validate the extent to which this assumption held true. Uh, assumptions two um, <coughs> addresses the core assumption that um, the global adoption of the SDGs in 2015 would be the principal driver of cross-sector innovations and data sharing for public good. Um, assumption three addresses the extent to which data are the main reasons for policy failure. A world that counts assume that if policymakers had data that were more detailed, timely, and relevant, they would develop and implement more effective and targeted policies. So to, to what extent did that hold true? Again, I will invite you to explore uh, chapter three of the assumptions report. Um, a world that counts also assume that persistent underfunding of official statistical systems could be overcome by providing roadmaps to guide investment needs, aligning global funding pledges to national statistical system plans, and leveraging innovative financing scheme from private sector participation. A world that counts also assume that governments will be the main institutional actors driving SDG achievements and accompanying data innovations. And lastly, it was assumed that data would be a force for accountability. That citizens would be able to use data to hold their governments to account. And so within each chapter, as I mentioned, we synthesize available evidence uh, since the publication of the report in 2015, 2014 to now. Um, and we also include expert input from authors of a world that count. Um, our hope is that this analysis will inspire conversation. It's not an endpoint, it's a starting point for discourse. Um, we intend to spark a discussion rather than give definitive answers pertaining to data use for sustainable development goals. And we hope to be able to spark some of those discussions today um, to um, glean collective ideation for concrete um, recommendations. So thank you for joining us. Um, without further ado, let's preview the interactive website featuring the assumptions report. And so this is the landing page for the testing assumptions of the data revolution project, uh, where we um, briefly synthesize uh, the objective of the project. You'll notice that it's in an interactive story map format. And so um, you can navigate to the specific assumption chapter that most interests you. 
uh, and sort of do a deep dive into what our synopsis of the research literature is for that specific assumption. I mean, we invite um, participants to contest us. Again, this is meant to be a discussion where you feel that we have sort of, if you feel that there are additional assumptions that we have missed or overlooked. Within each chapter, we synthesize subsequent experience, a discussion and future direction where we identify research gaps. And we have embedded survey questions within each chapter. Again, the hope is to make this as interactive as possible. We wanna get your inputs. And so we invite you to respond to some of the survey questions pertaining to some of the knowledge gaps that we've identified for each assumption. And um, again, 18 months of work, I'm delighted to be able to feature it today. And we invite you to visit the website and explore a bit more. Uh, but for now, let's dive into the discussion. Uh, we have with us some of the expert members from the Trends uh, Research Network um, and uh, I'm delighted to have them sort of react to some of the uh, queries that were brought up from this project. Uh, and so I'll briefly introduce our panelists and we'll dive into the discussion. Um, we have Grant Cameron, um, consultant and former director of SDS and Trends. Uh, we have Lisa Grace uh, Bersales, a statistician and executive director of the Philippines Commission on Population and Development. We have uh, Jess Espy, the founding director of SDS and Trends and uh, a lecturer on global development and environment at the University of Bristol. Um, Alex Fisher could not be with us, uh, but we have remarks that he's shared with us uh, that I'll uh, include in the discussion. Um, he's one of the principal authors of the Assumptions work and um, a research fellow at the Mo Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And lastly, Jonathan Galini, co-founder of Global Nation, where he oversees global public investment and global solidarity. So an illustrious panel, uh, let's go ahead and dive into the discussion. So I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, a world that counts fundamentally assumed that the data revolution would lead to better outcomes across the 17 SDGs. We are eight years from the report's launch and formal adoption of the SDGs. I'll ask a rather obvious question. Has more data led to better outcomes? We'll start with Grant, Lisa, Jess, and then Jonathan. All right, thanks, Castelline, and um, congratulations to you and the team for getting this important piece of work done and getting that platform up and, and operational. And I really hope this community of people who are participating and others have an opportunity to really go there and, and test and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the work that's been done. Um, this is uh, to sort of stimulate uh, further collaboration and further thinking on where we are. And I think sort of to circle back to Castelline's kickoff question about has more data led to better income, better outcomes, I think it would split that into two parts. Um, I think I'm gonna quote some of the statistics and facts since this is a statistics and facts kind of crowd. Um, and I'm gonna reference the UN SDG report 2023 special edition that's now online. And I think uh, you know that that report sort of indicates that it's pretty good news for data. Um, it's bad news for outcomes. So a little bit more detail on that. Um, you know, the document indicates that in regards to outcomes, it's time to sound the alarm at the midpoint of our way to 2030. The SDGs are in deep trouble. These are all quotes from the report. And it feels that um, after assessing progress on around 140 targets about half of those targets are moderately or severely off track, and about 30% have seen either no movement or have regressed since the 2015 baseline. So kind of a dismal but not surprising outcome regarding uh, outcomes, uh, SDG outcomes in light of some of the circumstances the, the world has faced over the last two or three years. But on the data side, the news is more positive. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the important thing is uh, the report knew to sound the alarm because the monitoring indicator data is pretty good. So there has been a lot of investments in improving uh, tracking the performance of the world through the SDG framework. The report indicates the number of indicators included in the global SDG database has increased, uh, increased from 115 to 225 in the last seven years. And the number of data records supporting that, uh, that progress has increased from about a third of a million to 3 million, so a 10 million increase over that same seven year period. So that's pretty good. So, um, you know, we, we know that we've made some 
some real progress on the monitoring front. Um, but we also know we've got some work ahead in terms of developing policies. And I think because of the dismal outcomes, the report in, identifies five action steps. And number two urges governments to advance concrete integrated target policies to get us back on course. And I think as Shada mentioned in her introduction, um, the data value chain comes into play here because I think basically what, what has been shown in the assumptions work is that um, we don't really know how much data for policy and program development has occurred over that seven years and has it sort of advanced to the same extent that the monitoring and evaluation and, and indicator frameworks have. And that great unknown is a bit scary at this point. So I'll just leave us with that scary thought and um, we can circle back to some of these issues through the discussion. Thank you. Good for data, bad news for outcomes. Lisa, please weigh in. Thanks, Kathleen. Well, my message is similar to, or it's the same as Grant's, yes. The data revolution indeed resulted in more data but not leading to better outcomes. However, what is good is that these data point to which areas of concern still remain and which population groups are really being left behind. Um, and, and, you know, uh, working here, looking at how Economic data seem to be really uh, progressing well in terms of uh, more granularity. Uh, Social economic data because of COVID-19, vital statistics reports have been produced uh, more often now and more timely. Environment data really where uh, we have, have stepped up toward from uh, civil society, private sector, and academia. Uh, but still, uh, the pace has to be hastened. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's really uh, a very important concern. We are doing good, but let's hasten the pace of uh, policies, uh, great better outcomes out of these data. Thank you, Kasten. Jess and Jonathan, um, has more data led to better outcomes? Hi, thanks, Kathleen. Um, and thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and such a great turnout. So thanks to all of you for dialing in at whatever time of day it is. Um, yeah, this is, I, I think, at the heart of the whole exercise you've done here, which is really commendable. And I think it's really important that we as a community take the time, or those of us working on data and statistics, um, take the time to think about you know, you can increase whilst the exponential improvements in data are welcome and should be commended and the political attention that's now afforded to data has really improved. And we can see that in the report that Grant mentioned and in a number of statements from national governments, but also the secretary general himself. You know, there really is a lot of attention to this issue at the moment, and that's really to be welcomed. But um, I think as you highlight in assumption three, we still have the, policy, the sort of uptake of that information for policy making purposes and the use of that information for designing effective policy responses is still something of a black box, um, which I think we need to unpack in a lot more detail to really make sure that that the, all this information that we're generating that is so crucial to success is actually being used to form effective policy. I think the other thing before I sort of go into a more technocratic response about how you could um, sort of better understand that and try and dissect policy making processes and understand how data can be used is also just to remember that since the SDGs were agreed and since 2015, there have been two huge movements affecting the world that have really kind of pushed and pulled interest in data and information. The first is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, where um, the importance of comparable cross-country rigorous information on health and different population statistics and so on was made so apparent. And the centrality of the UN and the WHO and all those different entities in bringing that information together 
was really made plain. And we saw political privileging of that kind of information, you know, with the likes of chief scientific advisors in many countries being brought to the fore um, to help really design policy. But at the same time, we've had this massive backlash um, and distrust in um, science and in other forms of expert information and in data and statistics. And we can see that. We saw that very clearly under the Trump presidency from 2017 to 2021 and under the Bolsonaro presidency of um, 2019 to 2022 in Brazil, where the former president you know, actively declared that the, st that the statistical systems information on the Amazon cover was wrong and he chose to disregard it and bulldoze large parts of the Amazon until the international community intervened. So the point being that um, we can talk about this in sort of technocratic terms, but there's also some really strong political forces that have affected progress and the impact on outcomes. And I think we just need to keep this in the back of our mind um, so that when we have this conversation, we can reflect on what was done effectively on the positive forces of change, i.e. during COVID, that we can build upon to use to counter those negative influences. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. Um, so we have to be considerate of sort of global events, whether that be COVID, recent wars, and how they affect um, Agenda 2030. Um, Jonathan. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, it's a really great report and co uh, commend the authors and also I'm pleased to have been kind of part of some of the discussions. And I think it is a really important debate to be having. Um, it, it, it seems to me that you've kind of answered the question ever since Grant's first comments, but also everyone else. I mean, if you've had seven years in which data has clearly improved a lot, but outcomes have not, then the answer to your question is no, data hasn't improved outcomes. Isn't it? I mean, that seems to be quite a simple case. And that's a really huge kind of challenge to those of us that work in evidence and research and data. And I think there's, there's, there's something here. I, I, wrote, I wrote about this ages ago. I keep on going back to it. I wrote, you know, this piece that basically said, you know, when we think about a revolution, often it's to do with actual power. And a, a data revolution will have been successful, not if there's tons more data in the world. That's not a successful data revolution. That's just tons more data in the world. It's successful if that data is in different hands. And so I think there's, it, 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 it's such a, it's such, it's, it's kind of a tension. On the one hand, data is simply evidence. It, data is knowledge, you know, and kind of obviously more evidence and knowledge, scientific knowledge in the world should lead logically to improvements and you could argue that that's quite self-evidently the case it's difficult to measure maybe in years but in decades and centuries it's quite clear that our knowledge of health meant that however bad the covid response was in many ways it was a hell of a lot better than it would have been 100 years ago it has to do with data and evidence and scientific knowledge and stuff like that so data is evidence and therefore is likely to produce better outcomes for people but data is also power francis bacon said knowledge is power and data is a kind of knowledge. So it matters who owns the data, who, 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 who has access to it. And the assumption that more knowledge and evidence means we will pollute the planet less, or perhaps even more profoundly, that we will become a more equal um, society and globe is a flawed assumption because it depends who has the data and, and powerful people can use data to further embed their power. Rich people can use data to further embed their wealth. Uh, polluters can use data and knowledge to further develop their strategies to put off the inevitable changes we require in society. So as well as more, we desperately need this data to be shared and managed in a different way. Um, and that, I think, is the great challenge of this, 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 um, this next decade. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you all. Um, and so what I'm hearing is that while greater uh, volumes of data, uh, greater access to knowledge and evidence has increased significantly in the past eight years, it has not sufficed to lead to better outcomes. And the relationship between data and outcomes is a lot more nuanced um, than sort of might have been previously assumed. Uh, there's a lot of interconnected factors, like who has access to the data, to what extent do they value it, um, and whether or not they use it in decision making, for example, will affect the extent to which it leads to better outcomes. Um, that leads to sort of our, our next question, um, which addresses uh, data 
and one of the key outcome measures of, of policymaking for SDGs. So assumption three addresses data and policymaking. Having access to greater volumes and variety of data has led to improvements in SDG indicator monitoring, but has this data been used to change national and international policy? Um, uh, Jess, I'll invite you to reflect on how data has been used to influence policy dis discussions in the UN. But first I'll read res a response submitted by Alex, one of our members who could not attend um, um, from a national perspective. Again, has data contributed to better policymaking in the past eight years? Um, and so Alex's remarks, we have observed many advances in the, in the statistical community to build capacity and innovative new methods. This community has also helped drive the complex SDG reporting um, at national and global levels. However, we have not seen equal commitment or advances from the policymaking community to incorporate data into their decision flows. This has taken longer than expected in many countries. The volume, velocity, veracity, and variety of data was not the main barrier to better policy. Instead, consider three key factors. So one, better use of data requires greater data analytics and data interpretation capabilities. Policy systems often lack capacity to analyze and interpret data and are often driven by political interest over technocratic approaches. Two, data capabilities required at all levels of decision-making, national, subnational, and local levels. The devolution of decision responsibility for SDG implementation has meant data is required by subnational and community levels to drive SDG outcomes. Um, this requires new platforms and capabilities for data access, visualization, and interpretation. And thirdly, uh, trustworthiness of our information systems has been under pressure since 2015, with data systems and government um, knowledge infrastructure being undermined by political interests and new technology accelerating mis- and disinformation. It is not only about more data, but rather building trusted collective intelligence systems. Um, so Jess, um, anything you would want to add to that um, from an international perspective? Um, to what extent has data been used to influence policy discussions in the UN? Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Kathleen. Yeah, I think this this question sort of riffs off what we were discussing before and is ultimately about how this information is affecting affecting outcomes. And Alex has highlighted lots of really important points there about what you need to do as a kind of essential minimum condition to ensure data uptake. So you better capacity, ensuring that, you know, not just central government actors, but a wide range of actors across government levels are um, sort of empowered to be able to use this information and so on. And those are certainly crucial points at, at any scale. I think um, from my work, which is currently very much focused on the international system and the UN, just a few for further sort of thoughts and reflections on how data has or has not been used to influence policy discussions. I think one of the things that we know from lots of other sectors is if you're trying to change international policy making or if you're trying to engage with you know, any part of the United Nations system or any other multilateral forum, the G7, the G20 or whatever. One thing that's really crucial is that you have a very coherent um, epistemic kind of community, a group of actors working together in order to try and articulate what it is that they're trying to see in and how they're trying to change policy. And I think one of the things that's happened internationally since 2015 has been the great kind of coalescing of this amazing community. The fact that we've got 117 participants on the line now listening to this, we've got all these different stakeholders, you know, we've got a statistician, a person running a really successful NGO on this topic, um, an academic and so on, academics, um, all coming together to discuss these issues is, is actually amazing. And it's been a real change in the way we address the kind of significance of data and the level and kind of issue of the issue that we're talking about and we're asking for. So I think that that's been incredibly impressive. Where perhaps we've been a little bit weaker on this first point around kind of coherent epistemic communities is we've been so focused on the on the actual um you know on the technic the technicalities of the information we want that we've fo focused less on the policy processes we're trying to actually influence. So if we talk in broad terms about we need more information on X, we need more data on Y. That's great and admirable and can result in more investment and more sort of technological improvement and new partners and new science and so on. But unless you're very clear on exactly how you're going to use that data to inform a specific policy process, it can be hard to affect change. And the SDG dialogues are wonderful and have been a brilliant mobilizing hook, but they're incredibly broad and cover a huge range of sectors and are constantly competing for topics and space. So it's quite hard to know exactly how to sort of say, look, we've got this additional data now on people living with disabilities and we should be using that to inform the conversation on, on X. And that's not to say that there aren't actors doing that, 
but they're all, it's happening at different levels in different sectors in quite sort of fragmented ways. And so I think we as an international sort of data community need to be quite clear on the substantive policy areas that we're trying to affect change on at any one time. Are we prioritizing equity and the disadvantaged groups are, or for example, the, the, in, the paucity of data around gender? And are we specifically all coalescing around key messages for policymakers on that one topic in this one political cycle? I think if we were clear about doing that, we could be more impactful um, at different political moments. I think the next thing that's really important from a kind of um, international level is about access, right? And having access to policymakers at the right political windows and moments in time. And if you look at um, one of the biggest barriers, essentially, to almost lots of different sectors for trying to affect change is to do with institutional access, right? So, you know, again, going back to the UN, because it's the, the world which I know best, but this could apply to many multilateral discussions, is that it's big, it's bewildering, it's complex. And as a, you know, a civil society activist or even a local government official or as a policymaker, you know, at different levels, you might find it incredibly um, sort of hard to access and understand. And, you know, it is this, this sort of amorphous thing. And that's partly because we have not demanded enough of our international policymakers to make specific spaces for actors to come in and present new information and present new science um, and present new data and analytics to them at these crucial policy making moments. During the SDGs, something pretty radical happened during those deliberations where the open working group, which was one of the modalities that was used to deliberate the SDGs, had these panels where they invited scientists and leading data experts and representatives from statistical systems to come and talk to them on substantive issues. So there was a panel on urbanization. There was a panel on you know, production and consumption. And they had statisticians and, and academics all sort of coming together to present their information before they started the policy deliberations. The UN doesn't normally work like that, but it should. <laughs> and we should be presenting this kind of really robust cross-sectoral information from lots of different experts um, to policymakers as they go into these incredibly pressing deliberations. You know, and just to provide one more example, and then I'll I'll shut up. But um, is you know, look at for example the science of urbanisation today. You know, more than two thirds of the population seem to be living in urban environments. We know that cities are, along with climate change, are the most fundamental driver of planetary change. Right? They are what is causing temperature controls, waste products, demand, supply, consumption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the future of our cities should be something that we are discussing with scientists, with statisticians, with all the leading world experts, with statistical um, experts from different cities around the world, with U the UN. And we should be coming in front of policymakers and saying, this is the most pressing challenge of our time. Here's the latest evidence. Now you deliberate once you've all got the same information in front of you. But that isn't what happens. Policymakers go, they deliberate, they decide their own positions in their own little country silos, and then they come back to these multilateral forums with their own individual country brief and try and mash together an outcome. So the point I'm trying to get to here is that our institutional processes are quite outmoded, they're quite old fashioned, they're very much based on, you know, country perspectives, country opinions, and there isn't a lot of space for the experts who are producing the kinds of information we're talking about here. And there needs to be a lot more space if we're going to have meaningful conversations about how this kind of information and data can affect change and can help design policy for incredibly transboundary, complex challenges. Um, there are many more things I could say on this topic, but I will, I'll pause there and maybe we'll have time to come back to it. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. So data can lead to more targeted policies if we value the data correctly and put them in the right hands. Um, I do invite folks to ask questions if you have reactions to Jess's and the other remarks that were made. Um, we'll do our best to get to the questions um, during uh, after the discussion. Uh, we'll move on to another topic which is important, uh, pertains to funding uh, for statistical systems. Um, and this question I'll, I'll direct towards uh, Jonathan. So assumptions, four covers funding for data and statistics. Um, international support for statistics amounted to 542 million in 2020, according to the most recent Press 2022 report. Um, this was a decrease of 100 million, 155 million from 2019 and 2018 levels respectively. The biggest drop in funding for data and statistics since the start of the SDG era. But despite this drop, um, the pandemic accelerated a number of data innovations and advances in the collection and use of statistical data. So Jonathan, given your work on aid and development financing, how should members of the data and statistics community adapt our approaches to planning and finance? While national statistical plans show the need for greater levels of funding, 
are we making progress in how we allocate funding to optimize the impact um, across the data value chain? <clears throat> so thanks for that. And I mean, I'm really appreciating the comments that have been made, including what Jess just said. Um, and you know, it does seem to me that it was impact. So we've just been discussing about what the relationship is between um, improved data and impact for people and planet. And it's clearly a um, complicated one, which we knew, but I mean, the, the narrative and the story that we're telling is going to confuse people. Uh, it's, not of, it's not a very clear one um, because we probably don't have the data to back it up, the evidence to back it up. So there was this report that Dolberg and the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data did, which was referenced in this, in our report. And um, they come up with this figure that $1 uh, 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 spent on data uh, will lead to $32 on average of economic product or economic impacts. Now, however one you know looks at that particular number, they're making an effort to link actual impact with um, increased funding for, for data initiatives. Uh, that clearly has to be the way forward. So the first thing that I think one, one needs to do I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not going to say anything that's going to, everyone's going to go, wow, I never thought of that. I mean, clearly that is like, it's pretty obvious. It's not, it's not, it's not so obvious that we always do it. I don't, we can't, we, what, and, and this is why I thought Jesse's comments just then were useful. It's, it, we shouldn't assume that, we, we sometimes do assume because we work in this area, but more data is just obviously needs to be spent. Uh, it needs to be gathered and therefore money needs to be spent on it. That's not an assumption that I don't think even holds in terms of research, let alone is convincing to people that, that have budgets. So we need to make the case that um, that this increased uh, spending will lead to impact. And that means we need to link, we need to think through how it will. And, um, you know, in my opening remarks, I said, you know, it's not the case that more evidence, and this again is what Jess has been saying and others, on the call, it's not the case that more will lead to better impacts. It's the case that more targeted, better applied, thought through, and what I was emphasizing, you know, power in the hands of um, particular people um, will lead to better impact. There's an assumption that, quote, policymakers and decision makers having more data will lead to better outcomes. I don't know if there's particular evidence for that, but I don't, I certainly don't think it's an assumption I would make, not an assumption I would make. I would require to see evidence for that because there's plenty of policymakers that will take really take current data and will take improved data and deliberately make decisions that are not in the interest of the majority and to increase inequality. So the idea that more data will lead to more moral or, or better decisions is false. It's also false to assume that even people that want to use the data in the right way will be able to, and Grant mentioned that and others. So, so focus on impact and then work out how precisely spending on uh, data interventions will is most likely to um, increase impact. It seems to me, and this is possibly an ignorant comment, others know much more about it than me, but it seems to me that the data revolution in terms of far more data is underway. It doesn't require much public intervention to lead to a world in 10 years' time where we have tons more data on pretty much every aspect of our lives. So the interventions that are required with public money are to ensure that um, the, 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 there is more fairness in who manages the data, that it's targeted in the right way, that people are enabled to use that data in a way that improves policy making, etc. And that, that and that um, that, that relates again the, the fact that this is public money we're talking about, uh, and it relates to power, and it's not just public money for public, uh, in other words, state. Um, organizations, but public money for civil society organizations as well, because the state cannot be considered the only uh, representative of people, of course. And then the third point I would make is is to kind of glo is to move from a vision of development, which is us and them. We can we donors can help others to develop data. Uh, in uh, basically in, in, in quotes developing countries which I think is which I think is now kind of old-fashioned language and I'm not sure how much longer it will last as a as a useful way to increase um, spending from the global north which is fundamentally where most of this money it comes from in terms of the international money um, 
And I think we need to talk a lot more in terms of global public goods. Not that particular phrase. I don't mind that. But 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 uh, publics ultimately in in countries that are providing money need to be persuaded that it's the right thing to do. And they need to be persuaded of impact. That's a really convincing story and argument. But they also need to be convinced, in my view, increasingly, that it's in their own interests. So this division between us and them is increasingly, as we progress in the 21st century, less relevant. And we all need to see how this spending on data or anything else in terms of international solidarity is in all of our interests. We all benefit from health security. We all benefit from climate security. We all benefit from reduced conflict and all of those kind of things. Just to finish on this, Kathleen, just one anecdote. I did quite a detailed analysis recently of the world of transparency. It's a particular area of data, which was, are we being our donors being transparent in how they are, um, in how they're spending their money effectively? That was a very successful fundraising uh, uh, theme from the from about 2007, 2008 onwards. And recently, you know, they had a good run, right? It had 10, 12 years of quite a lot of money being spent on that. I think recently that has come under quite a lot of questioning because it hasn't been clear that the way that transparency money, that kind of the, the, the funding of transparency w- was done, actually led to outcomes. Uh, and in, in, in fact, there's very little evidence that it did. Kind of obviously good, everyone needs to be transparent, but we spent millions on it, didn't massively lead to improved outcomes, and so funders begin to pull their money away. And I wouldn't like to see that happen in the overall world of data, which is a kind of vast, vastly bigger um, uh, kind, of, kind of theme. But unless we continually link the spending to impact, and in my view, to, to, to power and, who, and, and the who, not just the what, then I think we do run the risk of people kind of moving on from, from, from this kind of focus. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I also want to address that there are many remarks on this topic also um, in the chat and within the Q&A feature. We won't get a chance to answer all of the questions, uh, but I wanted to highlight that Claudia Wells uh, mentioned that we have problems with harmonizing coherent funding to statistical systems. Um, and thank you for the report that you've shared as well. Um, and there's a lot that we could discuss further um, so we've addressed funding, how to best leverage funds that we do have in the final seven years to achieve SDG outcomes. We've discussed the linkage between more data and better policies um, and the extent to which more data over the past eight years have led to better outcomes. And so there are lots of lessons that we can continue to reflect on. Uh, but I want to sort of think forwardly. Um, so in the seven years that remain, what can we do to better leverage data to improve sustainable development? Um, to achieve the sustainable development goals. And so uh, this closing question I'll address to Grant and Lisa, what will be necessary in the next seven years to best leverage data for improved SDG outcomes? Um, it's an ambitious question, but I, I'm curious to hear what um, what both of your takes on that. So we can get started with Grant and then Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I'll be very brief because I know we're under some time constraints. I mean, I think two things come to mind. Uh, I think in order for us to, to leverage data better, um, we do have to have a better understanding of some of the political economy issues that Jonathan's raised in terms of how, um, uh, how who and how we kind of arm people with data to encourage the best development outcomes and the best discussions about those development outcomes. So I think that's one important point. I think another point in terms of get sort of circling back to what we don't necessarily know is we do have good information and the indicators under SDG 16 about how the evolution of institutions has performed over the last few years. Um, there is a little bit of a big stuck as uh, some researchers have called it where, uh, you know, uh, line ministries and state capabilities haven't really progressed very quickly at the same rate that, that data has progressed. And to sort of unpack a little bit more if some of those things are just the inability to use the data that's already with us is something that I think would be really important for us to understand where the best data investments are. There may be quite a few countries where there is a willingness to take the right kinds of steps um, to pursue long-term development programs, but their ability as, as Alex's comments mentioned we just may, may not have the analytical capability to use the data that's there now, and we don't quite have a good handle on that. 
So I'll leave my comments there. Um, and just one thing to pick up in the chat, I would agree with Grace too, that when we think about state cap capability, we, we can't forget that implementation is a challenge. So knowing what to do and then acting on what to do, having the machinery to sort of deliver that is, uh, is something that is likely to constrain us over the next few years. Thanks a lot. Lisa, uh, what are your takes? What, how can we best leverage data in the final seven years of the SDG policy cycle? Thanks, Kathleen. Seven years is a So uh, my thoughts are as a global, let us already read all of those reports that have been produced using all the data uh, that uh, have been generated and uh, really focus on where we need, you know, stronger coalitions uh, uh, to, to, to help on policy making, to provide investments, to do capacity building. So which, what do I mean by this? Let us look at which uh, regions of the world uh, really need handholding, need, uh, uh, financing, capacity building, let's all go there and work together. Which uh, sectors are really being left behind? Are these the women, uh, the indigenous peoples? So uh, uh, as Jess said, let's be more targeted. So that's as a global community to identify which areas, what sectoral groups need more investment, more handholding. But I always say this, the work happens in countries. So uh, in countries, uh, my uh, suggestions are really produce more granular data down to the subnational level and really focus on what policies are needed for this more granular information. So like in the Philippines, we are trying to do, produce really more information on our um, uh, L more uh, more older persons how are they doing are they being left behind more data on indigenous peoples more data on women more data on uh, uh, farmers and fisher folk another one is uh, the national statistical system should be able to access demanding in the philippines uh, the philippine statistics authority is already able to get good funding from government but these funding could be augmented by other domestic sources. For example, uh, universities in the Philippines have used SDGs as a framework in reporting their uh, accomplishments on research and on public service. And they have budgets for this. And so they augment what the Philippine Statistics Authority produces uh, with more, more uh, newer data sources. And lastly, really, we really have to bring out their provide more data stories and how data are being used to produce policies. If my may I share with you that I'm now with the Philippines Commission on Population and Development, and we recently produced the plan of action for the Philippines population and development. And the president of the Philippines issued a memorandum circular approving it and directing all government agencies to implement this plan of action. And in my mind, why, 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 why was he compelled, and why was he um, able to say, "Okay, I'm going to go for this"? It's really because our plan of action used a lot of demographic information, informing the president of which population groups are really at a disadvantage. So, really showing that if we use data, they really could be translated into policy. Thank you very much, Cassidy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and so more uh, disaggregated data to um, develop policies and programs for populations, um, for all populations so that no one is left behind, I think was one of the key things that I, I pulled from your comments. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are limited on time. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a starting point, not an end point for a discussion on how to best leverage data for sustainable development. We invite everyone to visit the website to explore the Assumptions Project a bit more. Um, we'll close with a quick poll and we'll have closing remarks from our um, co-chair, Robert Chen.
And so uh, then the hope from this poll is to gauge your insights on uh, some of the main discussion items that were brought up. And so if you'll just spend a minute to answer these questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, question one, I'll just read them aloud briefly. Uh, from 2014 to 24, do you think, to 2024, do you think data has become a more prominent political topic in relation to achieving sustainable development goals? Um, how is data being referred to in policy discussions related to SDGs? Um, which sector do you believe has been most effective in using data to inform policy design? And lastly, for the next seven years, where do you think we should put priorities? And so we'd love to hear from you all briefly to gauge um, your thoughts on some of the, the key topics that we've, we've brought up. Um, and we will follow up um, on the Q&A that was sort of asked by audience members uh, bilaterally um, in post-webinar communication. So sorry that we, not, we did not have a chance to address some of the audience questions online. So thank you for your understanding. We will follow up um, sort of after the webinar. We wanna make sure to address all of the questions that were answered. Um, um, as far as the polling questions, I'm seeing that in the past decade, most people believe that um, data has become a significantly more prominent political topic in relation to achieving the SDGs. Um, that's great to hear. Um, and that it's mostly pertaining to um, an accountability tool for global monitoring. And so again, we've seen improvements in using data for SDG monitoring and reporting. How can we shift the scale to also see improvements in effective policy design in the next seven years is a question that we've posed um, for discussion today. Uh, which sector do we feel has been most effective in leveraging data to inform policy health? Um, I'm sure with the recent COVID pandemic, we've seen demonstrations of how you know, data analytics um, can improve uh, population health. Um, and lastly, for the next seven years, where do we feel we should put priorities? I'm seeing the overwhelming majority uh, feel that increasing political support for evidence-based policymaking is perhaps the most important uh, place to to kind of shift our uh, focus in the final seven years. Um, I think that's a great way to close. Um, and we invite everyone to visit the website. Um, I'll now turn it over to Bob Chen, um, one of our co-chairs for SDS and Trend for final remarks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Castelline. And um, can you post the results of the poll? It's right now, it's just showing the questions. Great. Yes. Um, so yeah, we're we're almost out of time, time not unexpectedly, and apologies for not uh, being able to have uh, panelists respond verbally to some of the questions uh, I've been trying to respond, uh, and I hopefully others have, have responded online to the poll function if you haven't uh, looked at those. Um, you know, I, I just want to close. I mean, I also had a lot of... Um, thoughts hearing all the discussion uh, uh, today, but uh, as Castelline said, this is the uh, uh, beginning of the discussion and, uh, you know, Trends is planning to pull information in, from the report, but also inputs from folks like you into uh, further outreach uh, at, at, you know, uh, in events like the World Data Forum and and such, so uh, we're we're certainly welcome <laughs> engagement by people here. Um, you know, I think Trends is in a, a good position. I, I made a comment about that in some of the questions uh, because we uh, are both international and cover uh, the different stakeholder and and groups involved. Um, you know, statisticians and experts and people of lots of government experience, both national and international. Um, so again, we we invite people to um, uh, participate and contribute. Um, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, the questions raised here affect the next seven years, but they also are presumably things that should be thought about in uh, the post 2030 environment. In fact, one of the questions that asked about whether there are too many goals and they should be narrowed. And I think obviously the similar questions could be asked about the data uh, because we have been sort of overwhelmed ourselves with so many different indicators and data with everybody wanting to participate that maybe, uh, you know, the we've lost sight of, of some of the key uh, priorities. 
but uh, that's for another discussion. So let me close there and thank everyone for participating and uh, especially the panelists. Uh, I think you can react with a clap or whatever, and um, I'll pass it back to, is it Cheda? Are you getting the last word? Um, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bob, and thanks to all the panelists, and particularly to Castellin and the team at Trends for organizing this um, this wonderful event. And we've had amazing, amazing questions. I'm trying to keep up with uh, answering some of them, but as uh, Castellin said, we'll definitely come back to some of you learning of, also from your questions as what's important and what you heard from us. Any other questions you have or any other feedback or reactions, please get in touch with us as you use the website and you have any feedback, get involved, get your network also involved in these discussions. And I hope it's been a good webinar, one of the first webinars in 2024, and we'll keep in touch with all of you. Thanks again, and have a great rest of the day, wherever you are. God bless. <laughs>